Thank you, Seth, and good morning. So good to be with all of you on this uh, April morning, April 23rd, and happy birthday to all of you who were born on April 23rd. I won't mention your names because I don't want to embarrass my granddaughter and uh, daughter, but uh, we are in John chapter 15 this morning. It's a great and glorious passage with some interpretive issues, but uh, we'll cover those. Let me read through the text. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Did you notice that? Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, And my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified in this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that you, and that your joy may be made full. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word, and bless our time of studying it together. Let's let's bow together in a word of prayer. William Carey was is called the father of modern missions. He was a man of amazing Christian accomplishments, a shoemaker, a cobbler by trade who opened up India for the gospel. In 1792, he preached a sermon, the title of which became his motto, Expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. That's a bold statement and may seem idealistic, but he did it. And it is what earnest Christians can do and will do because they can't be satisfied with a spiritually idle life. The spiritual Christian desires to be productive. God made us for that. And in John chapter 15, Jesus explained how it happens, how we have fruitful lives. That's the subject of our passage, fruit bearing. And the promise that the Lord gives here is that we will bear much fruit, not in our own strength, but in His. It is the, 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 the great things from God that He speaks of. But those things, fruit bearing, require abiding. That's the Lord's lesson. It can be summarized in verse 5. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. He uh, arranged his instruction around the figure or metaphor of the grapevine. He began the chapter by saying, I am the true vine. This is the the last of his I am statements, 
and many feel it was suggested to Jesus by an external object, maybe the great golden vine that decorated the temple gates. Chapter 14 ended with the Lord saying, Arise, let us go from here. And some think that the rest of the lesson occurred in the streets of Jerusalem as Jesus and his disciples were walking to Gethsemane. Along the way, they may have passed the temple, and, and there he began the lesson of chapter 15. Others feel they must have lingered in the room until after chapter 17, because chapter 18 begins, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples. So maybe there was a vine growing along the outside wall that hung over the window, and that inspired Jesus to use this metaphor. Wherever the Lord was, his statement wasn't due to what he might have seen, but what he had read in the Old Testament. And in it, the figure of the vine is used frequently of Israel. In Psalm 80, for example, Asaph wrote, You removed a vine from Egypt, you drove out the nations and planted it. And there are many other examples. But as Leon Morris pointed out, whenever the symbol is used of Israel, Israel is being reprimanded for being unfaithful and unfruitful or under discipline. But Jesus said, I am the true vine. He is the genuine vine, the faithful and fruitful vine, the only true faithful man who has ever lived, sinless and perfect. Whatever Israel imperfectly symbolized, Jesus fulfilled. Israel failed to bear fruit to God. Christ succeeds fully. And the lesson is, so do all who are in union with him. Jesus' Father ensures that. He's likened to a, a farmer or vine dresser, Jesus said, who cares for the vine in such a way that it will grow and it will be fruitful. He does two things. He takes away barren branches and he prunes or cleanses fruitful ones. <clears throat> Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Literally, the word prunes is cleanses. And that's the point that the Lord is making. The Father is involved in our spiritual development. He's involved in our sanctification, our spiritual cleansing, the process of producing spiritual growth in us. But the Lord illustrates that in his description of a farmer or vine dresser cultivating his vines. And that necessarily involves cutting back the branches to make the vine produce more grapes. On the face of it, it, it appears harmful, cutting off branches. But in reality, it is best for the vine because it removes whatever is harmful to the vine and hinders its growth and its fruitfulness. It was something the disciples were very familiar with and, and would not have needed an explanation. But but vines and wine is not the Lord's point, as indicated by the word cleanses. The Father prunes us. He cleanses us by removing what is harmful from our lives. This is sanctification. This is the process of transforming us within and making us more and more like Christ. Westminster Shorter Catechism gives a good definition of sanctification. It is the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. He only does that with his people, his chosen ones, those whom he loves, so that we develop in our Christian lives. There's no other way for that 
but to be pruned. And you think of that and you think, ouch, that's, that, that's painful. And it is, and that itself is instructive. We tend to think like Job's friends, that if a person is, is suffering, he must be sinful. God is disciplining him or her for something. No, not, that, that's not correct at all. Trials come to the righteous in order to produce growth, spiritual growth. Paul wrote of that in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 3. We also exult in our tribulations. Really? We exult in our tribulations? That's what he says. And then he explains, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. Now, of course, cleansing or pruning does also involve discipline as well, in order to influence us to give up what is bad and harmful in our lives. And discipline may be what is referred to in, in the first part of the verse, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. But uh, this, this is the difficult statement in the passage, the one that divides interpreters and divides the best of them. Is it about sanctification or is it about salvation? Is he removing unbelievers, those who, who falsely profess faith in Christ, apostates? Judas is the example of that. He only recently left the room, remember? And it was night. He was taken away. One argument in favor of that interpretation is the branch or person that is taken away, does not bear fruit. And no true Christian can be said to be without fruit. And that's true. Don Carson, who for many years was professor of New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, wrote an excellent commentary on the book of John and, and has written other books on this gospel. He wrote... Fruitfulness is an infallible mark of true Christianity. Every person who is born again has a new heart, has a new nature, has the Holy Spirit. Each and every one of us at the moment of faith are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. He is permanently there. And so we cannot but bear fruit. Now, we may not see the fruit in one another, but there will be some fruit in every child of God. Faith itself is the first fruit of the new life. When a person is born again and has a new nature, he or she will naturally believe the gospel when he or she hears it. Paul told the Philippians in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, that to you it has been granted to believe in Him, to believe in Christ. It has been given. That's what the word granted means. It has been given to believe. Faith is a gift. It is the fruit of the Spirit. A child of God will bear fruit by God's sovereign grace. It is inevitable. So the statement does not bear fruit settles the question for many. What makes it difficult is the statement, every branch in me. The phrase in me or in Christ is very common in the New Testament, very common in, in Paul's letters. It always refers to Christians. Christians can't be broken off from Christ. The Lord has made that clear in this gospel. Back in chapter 6, verse 37, he promised that all who come to him will be received. All who trust in him will be received by him, and he will not cast them out. And that is an unqualified promise, one put in the very strongest terms. I will certainly not cast out, in no wise cast out. The Lord used uh, two negatives there to emphatically affirm it. No, not cast out. He repeats the promise in the language that is just as, just as strong in chapter 10. 
his sheep will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Not the devil, not the Lord himself. Never perish. So either way, this is not about a Christian losing his or her salvation. That, that is as impossible as a true Christian never bearing any fruit. But the expression in me tilts me toward the idea of discipline. If so, then bearing fruit is not absolute, meaning never bears fruit, but describes a temporary state of rebellion or worldliness. And that happens to all of us, but not indefinitely. The Lord is patient, very patient with us, but eventually discipline comes, and to those who resist, it can be very severe, in which a person is physically removed from this world. There are examples of that in the New Testament, most notably those in Corinth who were abusing the Lord's Supper. As a result, Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30, that a number sleep. A number of them was sick, and a number slept, meaning they died in discipline. God took them out of the way. He removed them from the church because they were a hindrance to others and also to themselves. Divine discipline is that serious. Now, that may be the idea here. Still, it, it, it is difficult, and it makes me wonder if it isn't deliberately so. I, what I mean by that is many students of the Gospel of John have noticed ambig uh, ambiguity in a lot of the Lord's statements. And now it's deliberate ambiguity, not ambiguity because John wasn't being careful, but if that's the case, it's, it is intended in order to invite us to think rather broadly about things and to invite a couple of interpretations. So while there is one specific meaning, we may be uh, motivated or moved to see this as a double-edged warning. E either way, a, a serious person will heed the warning and avoid being taken away. But again, fruit bearing is the emphasis here. And it is serious business. It involves pruning, it involves cleansing, which isn't always pleasant, but which produces healthy change in our inner self. So really, we need to hope and pray for the Lord's cleansing work. It is necessary if we want to be fruit-bearing believers, and in fact, if we will attempt great things for God. The disciples were clean. The Lord reminds them of that in verse 3. The unclean one was gone into the night. But as believers, they should expect further cleansing according to Christ. Then in verse 4, he gives them the key to fruitfulness. And it's not pruning, as necessary and inevitable as that is, but abiding. Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Apart from this mutual abiding, us in Christ and Christ in us, there is no fruitfulness or progress in the Christian life. So Christ commands them. Commands them. This isn't optional. To abide in Him with the idea that they were to live in such a way that he would continue to abide in them. Leon Morris translated the verse, Abide in me and see that I abide in you. Only in that way can we be fruitful. So what does it mean to abide in Christ? Very simply, it means remain in Christ, dwell in him. For example, in Acts chapter 27, verse 31, we have the account of Paul at sea in a storm. And in verse 31, he told the sailors to remain in the ship. Don't abandon ship. 
They will survive only by remaining in the ship. And that word remain is the same word as abide. Now, it, it goes without saying that before the sailors could abide in the ship, they had to have boarded the ship. And the same is true for the one who abides in Christ. Before abiding, a Christian must first jo be joined to Christ, must be made alive and believe in Christ. That occurs through regeneration, through the new birth, and the faith that results from that. At the moment of faith, we are justified, we're forgiven, we're declared innocent of sin, we're de declared completely righteous in God's sight, and joined to Christ in a vital, living relationship that continues, and we are to con it continues throughout all eternity, but we are to continue in that fellowship. And as we do that, as we continue in that fellowship, we uh, increasingly partake of his life, the life of the vine, and as a result, produce fruit, sweet fruit increasingly. But we must first be in Christ before we can abide in Christ. Or as Dr. Johnson put it, I think he put it very clearly and well, Believing leads to union. Abiding is communion. Being in Him is the source of life. Abiding in Him is the source of fruit. And so it is essential that we stay close to Christ, that we stay in communion with Christ. Otherwise, we will produce nothing. That's what the Lord said in verse 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's a warning not to be neglectful. We are absolutely dependent on Christ. There is no spiritual growth apart from Him. That's the warning, as I said. But the encouragement here is great because the one who abides in Him, and there's, that's life. That's eternal life. Eternal life, as Jesus will explain later in chapter 17, is knowing God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. So there's nothing greater than eternal life, and eternal life is essentially knowing the Lord. And so abiding in Him, knowing Him, is the greatest blessing there is. But as a result of abiding in Him, we bear much fruit. We, we need that reminder because spiritual growth is not quick. It's not instant. It takes time, just as physical growth takes time. You, you didn't feel yourself grow up from uh, four feet to five feet when you were a child, but you did. And, and we grow gradually spiritually, and that can be discouraging, which is not all bad. We, we should never think that we have arrived. We should never think that, uh, that, that we're there. There's always more growth, more development into maturity. But there's also the danger in, in, in discouragement, in not developing as we would like, and we become anxious, and we get distressed over the fact we're not growing as we ought to. That's not all bad, as I say, but it can be discouraging or being pruned can result in confusion, a sense that we were being disciplined when perhaps we're not. We're just going through the trials of life because they strengthen us ultimately, which is why we need to turn to this passage at such times because of the instruction that it gives. The promise is, as we abide in Christ, we will bear much fruit. That, that should encourage us. Even though things may not be moving as quickly as we like, we will bear much fruit, he promises. And so we should be encouraged not to be complacent. We should be encouraged not to be discouraged. And instead, what we are to do is strive. We are to abide and strive in Him. We are to apply ourselves to this very thing, abiding in Him communing with Him, knowing Him more and more. But that takes time. Now this, this talk of vines and grapes is, uh, I confess, so foreign to me. I'm not a gardener. 
My wife will attest to that, although she told me you'll be doing some digging in the garden this next week and planting bulbs. So I have some experience, but very little experience of that. I don't uh, grow things, flowers or vines, and I guess James Boyce didn't either, but in his commentary he wrote that he once uh, was once told by those who know about cultivating vines that it takes about three years before a vine begins to produce fruit. It must be trimmed and allowed to grow, then trimmed and allowed to grow again, and so for uh, a, a considerable length of time. Only after this does it become useful for bearing fruit. Well, it's the same for us. There may be long periods when we don't seem to be very fruitful or useful. We're not to get discouraged. We're to abide in Christ, grow and mature, fellowship with Him. There, there is nowhere else for us to go and, and nowhere else where we are to be because, as Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. We're not going to find fruitfulness in any other place, in any other person than Him. And that includes faith as well as deeds. Sovereign grace is what, is what produces this within us. From our understanding to our faith to our deeds, as we act upon the things we know, sovereign grace. The consequence of not abiding in Him is given in verse 6, becoming fruitless and useless and suffering great loss. Such a person is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, this goes back to our earlier discussion. You will understand verse 6 according to your understanding of verse 2. If this refers to an apostate, and the Scriptures speak of that. Hebrews 6 is a great example of that. If this refers to an apostate, then it, the, the end is eternal ruin. That's a great warning to make your calling and election sure. But if this is a disciple who becomes idle and fruitless, worldly and useless, then he or she will suffer loss of great reward though not loss of his or her soul. That can't happen. I think we have a parallel for this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, where Paul wrote of the person whose work is burned up, who will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Now, I suppose there's some comfort in that, but there should be an absolutely no contentment in it. To come to the end of one's life with little to show for it is a tragedy. A largely fruitless life is a foolish life. Not only because uh, of, of the waste, but because the person who doesn't abide in Christ forfeits great blessing. The great blessing of fellowship with the second person of the Trinity and, and, and in Him with the triune God. Nothing's better than that. But also, we'll not enjoy the promise of verse 7. The Lord said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. That's the promise of prevailing prayer that comes with abiding in Him. Prayer is more than requests. When we think of prayer, we think of requesting things. And it is that. But it's more than that. It's also praise and it's thanksgiving to God for, for who He is, praising Him for His greatness. Looked at uh, Isaiah chapter 40 briefly in Mike's class, and you read that, and you cannot but praise God for His, his greatness of how small we are and how great He is and how much how great He has done things. He's created the stars and named them all and calls them out every night as though they're, they're a marching army. I mean, you, you begin to study the Word of God and you get to know the Lord more and more and you're full of praise for Him. 
And you're full of thanksgiving for what He's done for you, what He's given you, how He's taking care of you every moment and doing as, as Paul said in Ephesians 3, exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. So that, that is a great part of prayer. It's, it's thanksgiving. It's, it's praise. And, and prayer is a good gauge for abiding because when we are abiding, prayer is as natural to us as breathing. But prayer is also requesting the Lord's blessing. It is our, our, our lifeline to God and necessary for gaining His help. It, it's you may think, well, God is in control of everything. And I agree. And you hear me preach it all the time. He's absolutely sovereign. So why pray? Well, we pray because it's the means He has given us, a means of grace for obtaining the things that He wants us to have. We gain His help through prayer. And that's what the Lord spoke of here. Asking whatever we wish. But in order to get that, we must wish for what is pleasing to the Lord and is for His glory. And that means we must want what He wants and seek His will. And that, that requires that we know Him. Well, we only know Him by knowing His words, Scripture. His words are His revelation about Himself and about reality. What is true and what is not true. What's right and what's false. In Deuteronomy 18, the Lord promised... Israel to raise up a prophet for the people like Moses. I think he's speaking ultimately of Christ. But raise up a prophet like Moses. And he said, I will put my words in his mouth. Deuteronomy 18, verse 18. When prophets spoke, they spoke God's words. When apostles wrote, they wrote God's words. He breathed his words into them. That's inspiration. God breathing His words into men. That's 2 second, uh, second Timothy 3, verse 16. All Scripture is inspired of God. Well, inspired of God literally means God breathed. God breathed out His words into and through His apostles, His prophets. The whole Word of God is God breathed and inerrant and our authority. We cannot separate God's words from the Lord Himself from the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can only know Him according to the knowledge of Himself that He has given to us. And so obviously, to know Him and grow in our love for Him, we must know His revelation. All 66 books of it. Loving Scripture is loving Him. And when we know and love Him, we want to do His will. It's then that we will attempt great things for Him. And not what we think is great and, and, and what grand plans we wish for ourselves, but what is great and good for Him and His people. Prayer is not the means of getting a, a personal wish list. James stated the problem with unanswered prayer in chapter 4 of his book, verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. But if you want wisdom, God gives that freely over a lifelong pursuit of it. If you want selflessness and you want faithfulness, if you want holiness, God gives that and He gives it in abundance through a lifelong study of His Word. That is what it really is to attempt great things for God. For some, it, it may be giving up home and comfort to go to a far country and evangelize, be what we call foreign missionaries, but not for everyone. In fact, most of us are to stay here and be a light and we do that miraculously, supernaturally, by the wisdom that God gives in, in our day-to-day -day lives and in serving others, putting them first, just as Christ did. That's Christ-like. 
to put others first. Think of a man like Princeton professor and theologian Benjamin B. Warfield. I speak a lot of Warfield, very impressed with B.B. Warfield, who basically did two things in his long life and ministry. <clears throat> He taught his students faithfully year after year, and he took care of his invalid wife day after day. And she became an invalid weeks after they were married. And he never left her side. He was there every day with her, rarely traveled outside of Princeton. He took care of her. I've known people like that. You have too. That is a, a man or woman who is abiding in Christ and whose words are abiding in them. The result, prayers are answered, and they, they, they don't only attempt, they do great things for God and His people. What the Lord was saying here is, know God's Word. Learn the Scriptures. It is a lifelong practice, and, and the only way to know Christ and grow in love for Him, bear fruit and glorify Him. And in verse 8, the Lord returns to the idea of the vine and fruit bearing. He said, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Now, He, he didn't state specifically what fruit is. It could involve evangelism, could involve teaching, church planting, church building, building orphanages as George Mueller did by faith, not by fundraising. But certainly it is the fruit of the Spirit that is listed in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, which which is the character of Jesus Christ. And so it's becoming like Christ. It is chiefly in this way that, as the Lord said, they will prove to be His disciples. Well, the Lord is more specific in verses 9 through 11 when he, where He spoke of love, obedience, and joy. Those aren't random characteristics. There's a, a connection between them. It begins with love and with an amazing statement, really a startling statement about it. Jesus said to His disciples, Just as the Father has loved Me, I have also loved you. Abide in My love. Think of that. Think of that. He loved them and us, He loved us as much as He loved them, and He loved them and us as the Father loved Him. Now, how much did the Father love Him? How much did the Father love His Son? Without limit. Infinitely. And that's how the Son loves us. Unconditionally and without limit. That's how the discourse began. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. To the end of his life. To, to, to the end of the full measure of, of love. We should remember that when we're being pruned. When we're going through trials and difficulties. He's sovereign. He's all wise. He knows what he's doing. And I know that when you're healthy and things are just fine... It's easy to talk like this when you're going through the great trials, the protracted oftentimes, protracted ongoing trials of life. It's not so easy. But nevertheless, it's true. We should remember that He loves us infinitely, eternally, and everything He's doing is for our best when we're being pruned, even. Love like that deserves a response from us one of drawing close to Him and abiding in Him and obeying Him. That's what He said in verse 10. We're to keep His commandments. We don't do that in a, in, in a slavish, legalistic way. We do it from love. We've talked about this more than once. 
Love is the motivation. It's the the mainspring, as it were, for obedience so that it, it is not a burden. It occurs naturally. It's what we want to do if we love Him to the degree that we love Him. So we need to abide in Him. We need to continue in communion with Him and our relationship with Him. As we do, it grows and increases. Our knowledge of Him increases. Our appreciation and praise and thanksgiving for Him and to Him appreciate. Our love increases for Him. And that is the best life of all. It's not a burden. Far from it. It results in joy. That's what Jesus said in verse 11. He told them this and told us all these things. This whole discourse in chapter 15 has been told to us so that, as he said, your joy may be made full. The world challenges us at that point every day, doesn't it? Joy Happiness is found in following its path of self-gratification. And it's an attractive path. It's a, a very tempting way. That's why Psalm 1 begins with that. First Psalm, which is very much like a proverb to give us wisdom, Psalm 1 begins warning against the path of sinners who David said are like chaff, which the wind drives away. That's what happens with the wicked, ultimately. That's what happens with the way of the wicked, the path of sinners. The good life is the obedient life. It is life in Christ, in the vine, which occurs by God's sovereign grace the moment we believe in Christ, and which can never end and as we abide in Him, we bear fruit and we have real joy. We have the real, productive, full life. I came that they may have, might have life, He said, and have it abundantly. Well, that's how it comes to us. That's how we have it. Are you in Christ? Have you been put in the vine? That's the only way to bear fruit to a joyful life, and to the one to live to the glory of God, which is eternal life. Are you there? Have you believed in Him? If not, come to Him. Trust in Him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and gave Himself for us and from whom we can expect great things, the greatest things. God help you to do that. What a great thought it is, Father, that those He saves are His delight. Why would you be delighted in a sinner like me? That's your goodness and grace. And because of that, you'll hold us fast, every one of us, and bring us safely through the storms of this life into your presence forever. So we thank you, Father, for that. We praise you for that. And we pray, Lord, give us a desire to hold fast to you and abide in Christ. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.